Blessed be your name. Luke chapter 11 verse 2. Now from last week we started a series on prayer. Short series that I believe will end next Sunday. And I believe that God is taking us through this series to be able to not only inspire us, but give us knowledge to a certain level so that we can understand how to partner with Him. Bring into us the reality of prayer and its ministry in the life of a believer. I tell you, it is in prayer that we partner with God to bring to pass His purposes on earth. Even when a prophecy is communicated to you, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 1.18, Paul told Timothy, he said, remember, he said, this charge I command you, meaning this is non-negotiable, it's a charge, it's a command. He said, of all the prophecies that have gone ahead of you, so the prophecies go ahead of you to prepare a future for you. He says, but that with them you might war a good warfare. The prophecies will go ahead of you to create a future for you, but it takes the energy generated in prayer to propel you into that future. Did you hear what I said? The prophecies will go ahead to create the future. It's there. But you need a particular push. You need an energy beyond the natural to push you into that place. That's the reason why a lot of people carry prophecies on their lives and they don't see it come to pass. And it's not the fault of the pastor. Pastor Moses, you're welcome. Good to see you. Please, can we celebrate him? You're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Amen. I'm telling you, every time a prophetic word comes to you, this is not my message, but you need to hear it now. Every time a prophecy comes to you, that's when you should wake up your prayer gears. Because all of a sudden, the prophecy brings an attention. It brings a spotlight on you. And that spotlight makes you visible both to human beings and to principalities and powers. All of a sudden, the devil looks at you and says, Okay, no wonder God has a hand. The devil says, No wonder. And then he tells, the, when he looks at the volume of the prophecy, he tells the demon, He says, The better investment is let's attack this man. Because the prophecy on his life will help him become strong to raise 1,000 people. So rather than attack 100, let's follow this one at least. If we get him, we get 1,000. That's how it happens. So. Even when a man of God prays for you or you go to see and hands are laid and impartation, do you know that you have to activate those dimensions in prayer? Because in impartation, do you have a handkerchief please? I'm sweating. Anybody has an, a handkerchief here? Please help me with it. Thank you. Maybe my handkerchief went to heaven and it didn't come back. Amen. When impartation comes on an individual, listen, impartation is a personality from a higher dimension by reason of grace or mercy or whatever bringing you from a lower level to that level it's like i bring you to my class let's say i'm in class nine and he's in class one just go back a little sir and then somehow maybe because i'm excited or by reason of grace and mercy i have the license from god based on my covenant with god based on my sacrifices based on my work with god and my understanding of spiritual things i can bring him from class one to class nine he doesn't understand the laws governing class nine he doesn't understand the principle for operation in class nine but i brought him to class nine but he's not going to begin to walk in the full expression of the realities in class nine what he will have for a brief moment is the trial version. You know some games on your phone, when you play them, they say, play the demo or the trial version. And when you play it to an extent, they'll stop and say, go and buy it. Go and download it. So the impartation may seem to be working for a while. That's the trial version, the demo version. So that he can understand the realm he now is in. The next thing is for him to understand the sacrifices and the protocol in this realm. That can license his stay here. So if in class 9 we pray 7 hours a day. And he just prays 30 minutes. 
after a while if that grace doesn't find this operation it will lift you see why you collect a lot of impartations and after a while you are right where you started that's why paul told timothy he said the prophecies that have gone ahead of you you need to pursue you need to propel yourself into it by warring a good warfare you need to activate certain things there are times when you pray not because of anything you are just activating the prophecies the volume of prophecies on your life sit down sir god bless you that's the reason why prayer should become a lifestyle as a believer you can compromise any other thing but prayer did you hear what i said you can compromise any other thing but what prayer no matter how busy I am, I, I, know, I know where it starts from. Prayer. So last week we started this series and I, I decided for us to journey through the book of Luke. The reason is because of all the four Gospels, the one Gospel that speaks a lot about the prayer ministry and life of Jesus is the book of Luke. And I believe that the first person we should study in the Bible when we want to understand anything in God should be the life of Jesus Christ. And I don't have time to take you through from chapter 1 to chapter 24 and show you how prayer was relevant in his coming, his lifetime, his baptism unto death and his resurrection. At the end of that book, he told the disciples, he said, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power the word tarry is a word that communicates prayer it means wait stay and while you stay keep praying until power be released in other words your prayer will create a capacity in you to receive the volume of power that is to come prior to that time the holy ghost had never descended in full dose on the earth the only time he did was on Jesus Christ. When the Bible says the Spirit of God descended like a dove. Like a dove meant in its fullness on Jesus. And the Bible says he was praying when he came out of the water. And so we started last week. We looked at three aspects of God in prayer. I showed you the aspect of God as Father. Where we ask and make requests. And present our needs before him and he is all sufficient to release unto us that which we ask i showed you the aspect of god as friend where prayer now becomes intimacy with him fellowship where you are interacting with god as a friend it's like a walk like a journey and then the aspect of god as a judge where you need to secure the justice system of heaven on your behalf now this week I want to show you something very simple but very powerful. If you understand this principle, every time you pray, you can change the climate over you. Every time you pray, you can get God to act on your behalf. How many of you want to get to that point? That every time you pray, God moves on your behalf. You see, it's only people that don't understand these things that will think God has favorites. No. God doesn't have favorites. He has intimates. If you understand the principles that govern his kingdom, you will walk as though you are his favorite. And so the men of old in scripture understood these things and it's important in our time, this end time generation, this last day generation that will usher the greatest revival of all times it is important that we understand these things well enough to make them experiential in our lives somebody say amen so tonight this is how the topic will be your heart posture in prayer your heart posture in prayer then write in bracket touching heaven changing earth Touching heaven, changing earth. That a man can touch the heavens and create a change on earth from that standpoint is possible. Luke chapter 11 verse 2. Let's join it today. So he said to them, now Jesus was praying in a, a particular place and the disciples came to him. 
and ask him to teach them how to pray give it to me in king james version luke chapter 11 verse 2 and after that we'll read matthew chapter 6 verse 10 same thing but just uh, want to pull out one word and walk with it and he said unto them when you pray say our father which art in heaven read together from this point one two go hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done as in heaven so in earth that's not correct english yes or no as in heaven it may be correct but in earth is not correct it should rather be on earth isn't it because we're standing on the earth matthew 6 verse 10 same translation matthew 6 verse 10 thy kingdom come thy will be done where where as it is in heaven thy will be done in earth now the context of these two scriptures i decided to read it from the two accounts matthew's account luke's account so that we can understand that they were saying the same thing and then get what god wants us to learn tonight if you are here say amen so the bible says that god's will be done in earth not on earth if he has said on earth it could mean that god wants his will to be done he wants his purpose to be accomplished amongst men all right in this cosmos in this world in the different spheres of society god has a plan he has a purpose and he wants to see it manifest but when he said in earth he was talking about this earth your body because there are two earths that god created the first earth is the earth that we inhabit and the second earth is the earth that habits us this earth that we stand in and then this earth that we live in your body not only does god want to see his purpose come to pass in our world but he wants to see his will done in the life of a man so every man was given a body to come on this earth to fulfill something in the plan of god to bring to pass his purposes and his expectation he said thy will be done in earth was jesus the writer of hebrews said a body has thou given me he said i have come to do your will O lord a body has thou given me so the will of god for it to be done in this life the will of God must first be done in your life. You are the first prototype. You are the first blueprint. You are the first experiment of the accomplishment of God's will. He said, I will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I want you to understand something this afternoon. That the government of heaven and the authority of heaven for it to find expression on the earth for it to be able to influence this earth that we live in it must first of all be enthroned and be esteemed in the heart of a man because when you pray what you are doing is you are partnering with the government of heaven you are partnering with the authority of God in his realm to bring to pass his will. Of course, the word will means that there is a king you are talking about. The word will means that there is a government being represented. The word will there means there is a constitution of that government that must be practicalized on the earth. Because God created this earth as a dummy uh, 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 realm to express the realm that he dwells in if you are with me say amen. amen god dwells in the realm that is spiritual but he created this material universe to express the realities of his realm so in prayer what a man is doing is that he's coming in partnership and in alignment with that government and so the government of heaven must be enthroned in your heart first before it can become a reality in your life 
that means that your life plays a very important role your heart rather plays a very important role in the fulfillment of god's purposes in aligning to the will of god's government somebody say the heart you know when we talk about the altar in the old testament god constituted the priesthood in, in you know in, in the nation of israel that they were to offer sacrifices of atonement for the sins of god's people every day there were sacrifices that we were to perform in the temple and these sacrifices were done on what was called an altar something was built up a platform was built up upon which these sacrifices were made and then when the smoke ascends to the sky it was seen as a sweet smelling savor to god it was more or less like god was invited into the nation of israel based on the covenant of sacrifice that they had so every time they offered sacrifice to god god was pleased with them and god had the license to act because in genesis chapter 1 when god said let them have dominion from that day god exempted himself from this universe somebody say but apostle the bible says god is everywhere it's true god is everywhere but god cannot manifest everywhere God is everywhere, but God is not Lord everywhere. What he wants to do is bring you to a point where through you, he can become Lord everywhere. Because it is when he is Lord everywhere that you can see the fullness of his power and of his grace. That you can see the manifestation of his kingdom. Because when an accident happened, was God there? God was there. And the question is, why couldn't he stop the accident? That's why he says, and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Lord means owner. That when men on earth affirm his lordship in their life, God receives license to operate and to act. I tell you the truth, the volume of the power of God you see in your life is the degree to which you submit to his lordship. Lordship. Is he your owner? Can he wake you up in the night and give you an instruction that you will carry out? Does he have freedom of expression in your life? Or is, he, is, he, is, he, is, God, is God regulated or bound by your disobedience or your delayed obedience? They are the same thing. I hope you know. If you are with me, say amen. So God wants to be Lord, but He cannot be Lord everywhere. He will only be Lord in the life of a man whose heart has completely surrendered to His government. So what you called an altar in the Old Testament, in the new testament where there are no longer sacrifices to be offered like in the similitude of the priesthood of aaron there is no longer need for that sacrifice for the atonement of the sins of man because the ultimate sacrifice jesus christ had died on the cross so there was no need for the sacrifice of bulls and goats and cows again and rams this time around the altar has gone from a physical monument to a reality in a man that altar becomes your heart your heart your heart becomes that altar so everything that you will do to influence the government of heaven god will read it from your heart now that's fortunately and unfortunately fortunately meaning that you don't always need to pray out loud for god to hear you because he can hear what comes from your heart but unfortunately it's because you you don't even know where your heart is talk to me come on point your heart for me everybody i know where you want to point this vessel pumping blood i told you that the bible says the heart of man is deceitful the word deceitful means huh it's crooked and he says desperately wicked he said no one he didn't say no man no one meaning man and spirit no one can discern the word discern there does not only mean to understand it means to search out the position of the heart and then in the next verse he says i the lord searcheth the heart 
So only God knows where the heart of man is. Even the man doesn't know where his heart is. That's why you think he's humble till he has one million in his account. Praise God. You see another person. He will re the real person will resurrect. Somebody say amen. I know you will not say amen. I understand. I know many of us, you have been there before. Even you, you didn't know yourself. Those days when we're in school on campus, when there's no money and you are broke, you walk around as though life has come to an end. As though God should just take you home. You can even be singing that song. This world is not my home. Because the hunger can so come on you that you begin to see the heaven. You begin to see heaven from a distance. And then while you are walking under the blazing sun like that, hungry and thirsty, your phone just vibrates and you look at it. There's a credit alert. All of a sudden, life comes into you again. Yes or yes? Talk to me, come on. Sometimes the hunger even disappears. I remember one time Bishop told me, he said, most of the sickness in school is not sickness, it's hunger. <laughs> Amen. And then all of a sudden, because there is credit alert, your mind will forget about every other thing and you start thinking of the things you can do with that money. Some of you, if it's one million, for three days you'll be thinking. Maybe you have not seen that amount before. For three days you just go about thinking. All of a sudden you start dreaming of a car. Yes or no? Now, I'm, I'm using that just to illustrate to us what the heart is all about. The Bible says the heart is only God that can discern where it is. And that's why it becomes difficult if God must speak our sacrifices, our attitudes of intimacy, of devotion to Him. God, if God must speak it from our heart, it becomes a little bit difficult. Because only God can tell the true state of your heart. Let me show you some scriptures. Daniel chapter 10 verse 12. And then after that Psalms chapter 19 verse 14. So let the lifting of my hands touch your heart. Let the lifting of my voice reach your heart. My worship touch your heart. My devotion touch your heart. Oh, where the lifting of my hands touch your heart. So I'm not doing it to make a show before men. I'm doing it to please you. I'm doing it so that it can touch your heart. Let it be accepted in your heart. Touch your heart. My devotion. Touch your heart. Verse 12. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set thy heart. Somebody says, Set your heart. I think it's the Bible that says in Colossians chapter 3 from verse 2 it says set your heart on things above not your mouth your heart your heart is the core aspect of you your heart is who you really are that is you in your most natural state that is where everything about you emanates from the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4 verse 24 it says, keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it comes what? The issues. The word issues there, the illustration is like a stream. Coming from a source and then spreading out to other places. It's like flowing like a stream. It says, just the way streams can flow from a particular source. It says, so also the events in your life are orchestrated by the nature of your heart. That's why I believe that anybody that just died, somehow, either they knew that they were going to die or they began to, to think about death. There was somehow an affinity between them and death before it happens. 
It's to us that it happened suddenly, not to them. That's the reason why if you see a man living in a cycle of failure and misfortune, something is definitely wrong with his heart. You can't live above the nature and the state of your heart. He says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's why the Bible says we should set. It's like a radio station. Uh, you know, you have a radio. And on your radio, you can pick several stations. But you have to tune to get to the particular station you want. The one, as you begin to tune, you can get to a point where you begin to hear the other station. Or the, you hear the station of your choice. But you may be hearing it faintly. So you have to tune it correctly to get to that station. Sometimes you might even be between the frequency of two stations. Have you, have you, have you experienced that? That's why I say set your heart. On things above, not on things below. Now look at Daniel. The angel was saying to Daniel. He said from the day you set your heart to understand and to trust in thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard. He didn't say you opened your mouth. He said from the day you set your heart. What happened? Your words. That means God does not pick our prayer from our mouth. He picks it from our heart. That's why I just brought that scripture. That's why you, know, you can come to church and find... When they say pray, you see some people. And they are looking everywhere. Punching their phone. Adjusting their chair. Some might even be taking selfie. Why? <laughs> But for you to be able to concentrate, that's why we say close your eye. So the reason is because it is your heart that God listens to, not your mouth. Your mouth is only to train your consciousness and bring it to a point where it is absorbed in the prayer. Your mouth takes care of your mind. All right? conditioning your mind to know that yes i am praying so i need to observe maximum attention but the true place where your prayer comes from is your heart your heart you now see why sometimes people pray a lot and it seems like nothing is changing around their life something maybe is wrong with their heart i'm going to show you and then we'll pray he said, from the day you set your heart to understand. Another scripture, Psalms 19, verse 14. Psalms 19, verse 14. And because Daniel's heart was in the prayer, that's why even though the answer was delayed, he kept, he kept on praying for three weeks. You see, the fuel of consistency Is the condition of your heart once your heart is in a thing you stay committed to that thing when you find people who no longer come to church regularly again check very well their heart is no longer in that church yes or no that's just the truth or probably you are in a relationship and then the guy is no longer calling like before you are the one that will call two times, send texts, then he will respond two days later. <laughs> oh girl, his heart has left that relationship. And you know the Bible says the heart of man is what? Deceitful. But you know ladies, they can hope very well. After all, the Bible says hope maketh not ashamed. So apostle, I don't know what is wrong. Oh. It's not picking my call again. I'm always the one calling and calling. Oh girl, his heart is no longer there. Think again. Because when a man's heart is in something, consistency becomes abounds. The Bible says, For where your treasure is, there lies. So if you see a man come to church every day, he's not tired with all the work they give him to do in the house of God. He's steadfast and committed. His heart is there. And I tell you the truth God will pick or He will read the quality of your service on earth to Him based on the nature of your heart how committed was your heart to it not eye service eye service can deceive men but the bible says in hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 
before him lays naked all things god told samuel in first samuel chapter 16 he said you men you look at the outward but i look at the heart he said let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be what acceptable in thy sight in other words oh god let the prayer that comes out of my lips match with the motive of my heart match with the enthronement of you in my heart that i'm praying to you because you are my lord and i mean it from my heart because there are some people who pray but they already have option b and c in case god no work some god is even option c let's try a and b and when it's not working and they are almost being swallowed they say god are you there Once in a while, God gives me the permission to be able to discern the heart of men. Some when they come for prayers or counseling or whatever. And once I see that the person's heart is not ready to succumb to God's terms and condition, eh? I don't pray. Or I pray a deceptive prayer. Or I turn it to gist. Who we'll gist, gist, till you forget why you came. Then you just go. Because it's a waste of time praying for somebody whose heart is no longer with God. Huh? God told Samuel, he said, how long will you mourn over Saul, seeing that I have rejected him? It's the heart. You want to touch heaven. You want to influence the heavens and command change on earth. You want to bring God on the scene and see God move in your life in a way that it dumbfounds men. You must get this thing about the heart. The Bible says God acts on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9. On behalf of those whose hearts heart are loyal. Yes, it is tiresome. Yes, it is not easy. But their hearts, you know what loyalty is? 100% submission. In the military, they say 99.9% .9 loyalty. And 0.1% disloyalty is equal to disloyalty. So every time God will walk in your life, He comes to check your heart first. That's the first thing He comes to inspect. And we must get it this night. We want to see the move of God in our time. We want to see the supernatural. It's not like God cannot move or God cannot act. But God is looking for men whose hearts are one with Him. God is looking for men who have exchanged their desires for God's desire. Who have died to their desire and they are living for God. Men that will say, like Jesus said in the garden, He said, Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Even when your will is for me to die, but your will. Even when your will is for me to go through shame for a period, but your will. Even when your will is for me to lose this appointment. Because everybody thinks that faith. It's always you must receive something. But sometimes with faith you can reject some things. It's a proof that you are acting by faith. Sometimes a door can open and you walk to that door. I've said it before. And you close your eyes and shut that door. Because you know God is not interested. That's why be careful what you call breakthrough. The heart. The heart. So why is God so interested in our hearts? Why is it that our prayer is not enough until the heart posture is accurate? I'll give you two things and then we'll pray. Number one. God is interested in your heart because faith is a reality in the heart of man. That's number one. Faith. I know that your faith will produce an action. But the origin, the root, 
is your heart. Romans chapter 10, from verse 10, from verse 9 rather, it says, If thou wilt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you will believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, he said, you shall be saved. Then verse 10, he said, for with their heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Remember, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness. Righteousness there means aligning with the principles, with the constitution of the government of heaven. In other words, bringing yourself to a point where you are a good citizen of heaven where you stand in line with the laws and the custom of that kingdom seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness he said for with the heart man believeth unto so you stand with god first from your heart your alignment starts from your heart with the heart man believeth I guess it is in Mark 11 verse 24 that says, Whatever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive it. And then you shall what? Have it. So you believe first to receive. Then you shall have. Receiving means it becomes yours in the realm of faith, in the realm of the spirit, before it comes to you in the physical. Because anything that is not achieved in the spiritual can never manifest in the physical come rain come sunshine if it happened in the physical it was a reality in the spiritual now your heart is that part of you that relates with the realm of the spirit and that's why the bible says it is your heart that you believe so if the bible says we must believe to receive it means that the condition of faith must be gotten in your heart first james chapter 4 he says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss to ask a means means two things. Number one, it means to ask without faith. Because James chapter 1 says, Anyone that lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. He said, Let him ask of God who giveth freely and upbraideth not. He said, Let him ask, doubting nothing. He said, For such a man, let him not think he will receive anything from God. For a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. So your heart condition must be complete. You must bring yourself to a point where you totally believe God will do it. You believe that if God doesn't do it, then it can never be done. Not have God and other options. No, somebody will say, hey, let's be on the safe side. And now they have looked for other scriptures. Before they will say, heaven help those who help themselves. But they, knew, they discovered that we, we have discovered that there is no scripture like that. You have not even heard some. Somebody say, arise and I will help you. That that's what the Bible said. From where? So the arise is go and pay bribe. He said, arise and I'll... so they have discovered that we don't we, we, we know that all those scriptures are not in the Bible. They are just a, a scriptures of emotionalism, trying to bring God into the environment of culture. We play God as though He's our culture. And so they have looked for another scripture. They say, wisdom is profitable to direct. And they use that as an excuse for faith. No. God is interested in your heart because that's where faith starts from. That's where the word of God gets to first. That's where you begin to believe. Because whatever you believe with your heart, no matter the conditions around you, you will remain undaunted. Your convictions are sealed. And after a while, the conditions around you will bow and conform to the nature and the, the reality that is in your heart. That's why I say, for we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal. But the things that are not seen, you only see it with the eyes of faith in your heart. That though my beginning was small, yet my latter end shall greatly increase. And you are convinced, you, your, your conviction remains strong like a rock. And you are ready to go through anything. He said, for I reckon that the sufferings of this time are not to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. He said, all the days of my appointed time, I will wait till my change. When, when your heart is sealed up with these things, you are not moved. Anybody you see always afraid in the midst of situations, his heart that's the state of his heart. 
Are you hearing me? Be seated. I meant it when I told you nothing gets me afraid. I'm telling you nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. The worst that will happen is death. And the Bible says death is swallowed up in victory. Did you hear what I said? It's with the heart. Faith comes from the heart. And that's the reason why you must treasure the word of God there. That's why you must bury the word of God in your heart. This is, it has nothing to do with being a pastor. It is the requirement of every believer. Your heart. Because the day your faith will fail. He can also accept, he can affect your heart. Huh? Jesus will tell his disciples, he say, let not your heart be troubled. Let not means do not permit it. Do not allow that your heart is troubled. So God picks. God is interested in our heart because faith is a reality in the heart, number one. Number two. God is interested in the heart because it is in the heart that he tests the motives and the intentions of a man. Hebrews chapter 4. Let me show you something in verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And then we'll go back and read Luke's gospel. Chapter 12, verse 29 to 34. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It is in your heart that God tests your motives. Test in this context is not temptation. No. Are we together? Just for somebody who is here, test in this context. When we say God is testing a man, it doesn't mean God is tempting a man. Because the Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 13, that God does not tempt with evil, neither is he tempted with evil. Say, let no man say of himself that I'm, that I'm tempted by God. No. Temptation is when you are drawn away by your desires, you're lost. Trials is when God allows situations around you, situations that are not pleasant to come around you, so that your reaction to those situations will show the nature and the reality of your heart, which is who you are. That means who you are is revealed in the midst of situations, adverse situations. How many of you know a lifting tea bag? You know the real color of lifting when you throw it where? Hot water. If you throw it in cold water, will it show anything? So you need to throw it where? Hot water. In the midst of the furnace and the trials, your response shows who you are. And for every time God will translate or migrate a man to different... Let me tell you. <laughs> because there are certain levels of blessings. If God gives you, eh, you will become the next terrorist against the kingdom of heaven. God himself, he knows he can't trust you. So he needs to train you to a point where you can be trusted. And that's why he will release a blessing commensurate to your capacity. And then your response and reaction to that blessing will show the state of your heart. Whether he's still number one or he have reduced him to number ten. If you reduce him to number ten, God will say, ah, thank God it was small we gave him. It was hundred thousand. Just leave him there. Maybe after five years, he will wake up. And then for five years, he's collecting one salary. He has sown seed. He has prayed and fasted for promotion. They have laid hands. He has gone for miracle service, deliverance service, all night service, prophetic service, mantle service. Which other one? Talk to me, come on. Which other one? Eh? Breakthrough service, yoke breaking. He has gone for all kinds of service. But he's not moving from that level. You know why? The real service he has not gone for, which is his heart. Because God said, if I lift this guy from 100,000 to 1 billion, one of my dickens in those days, he said, you will tell God, walk out with your two hands and your two legs. The Bible spoke of a man called Uzziah in the book of Second Chronicles. The Bible says, 
he was marvelously helped by God till he became strong. He said, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. He became proud. He became an enemy to the one who lifted him. Look at this. He said, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thought and intents of the heart the thoughts and intents you have it in amplified the thoughts and intents the thoughts and intents the thoughts and intents the thoughts the thoughts there is your reasoning the intentions there is your imagination you reason with information, you, 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 your, your imagination works with, works with pictures. These are two realities inside of you. The Bible says God discerns it. Before you came here, dressed like this, it was already a reality in your imagination. You saw the picture, you created the picture inside of you. And then you made it a reality. That's why the Bible says, God is not a discerner of what you do outside. No, it's a discerner of the real place of creation, which is in your heart. Look at Amplify. He said, exposing and sifting and analyzing the, and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. So a heart can have a purpose outside of God. That's the reason why God is interested in your heart. He wants to see if your heart and the world that is inside there conforms to what he wants to do. You say, Lord, I am your friend. I am a friend of God. God will say, I will check you too. I will check your heart first. Meanwhile, in his heart, he say, if I hit that 1.5 million and that Hennessy, that Hennessy that pass. And I have no problem you buying car and all of that. <laughs> it's just that some people allow those things to control them and not did those things. So as a young lady, let me just get this money so that that shoe, that shoe, how many inches? Six inches, ba? If you wear slippers, what will happen to you? Or flat shoe? Amen? What will happen to you? Will you die? Say no, six inches. That one, six inches. She can forget her Bible. But she will not forget putting slippers. Or putting the shoe inside the bag. Then wear slippers. Then when they come to church. Now that just reveals to you the heart of man. Even in ministry, why do you want God to use you? Is it so that you become popular and famous? So that they will be saying, celebrate our man of God, apostle. Jesus. So that the way they used to say it for him, let them say it for me. Ha! Ah. I wish it was a bed of roses like that. Too. It's you people that see the roses. You don't know the thorns. You don't have your life. It's not your life again. Let me tell you the truth. Many people think being a man of God is independence. I lie. That's first class slavery in the kingdom. Jesus told the disciples, He said, But I have been among you as one who serves. He said, So let him that will be the greatest do what? Serve. A true call to ministry is a call to consecration, is a call to service. God can look at you and say, Don't get married. And your congregation is filled with all kinds of beautiful ladies. And God says, don't get married. But God, you say, if you, if you don't want to burn, get married. And God, I'm born. God says, born there. God can wake you up one day and say, for 100 days, give me three hours of prayer every day. When God has established you in a place... And now ministry is moving. God will say, oh, yeah, your time is up. Leave that place. Ah, but make I enjoy small now. God said, no enjoyment. Leave. After trekking for a while, they will bring a car to you. Ah, finally. 
God has brought me to my real home and said, that car is not your own. You know, it's when you know these things that you can now count the cost, whether you want to be in ministry or not. The motives, the intentions of our heart. Give me Luke chapter 11 as we round up. Verse 12, chapter 12, rather, verse 29 to 34. Verse 29 to 34, Luke chapter 12, New King James. My worship touch your heart. My devotion touch. It all belongs to you. Oh, it all belongs to you. It all belongs, it all belongs to you. To you, oh God. Yeah. It all belongs to you. It all belongs, it all belongs. It all belongs to you. Everything I give to you. Sing it one more time, say it all belongs. I give you everything, oh God. The motives, the intentions, God will test the motives and the, some of you are already is already you are in a season where he's testing it you may not know one of the ways you know god is testing and trying the motive of your heart one of the ways he brings successive instructions for you to comply with a lady came to sow a seed into my life and you know usually you'll be provoked and want to release blessing isn't it Rather than blessing, what came was instruction. Tell her to give me so-so amount every month for one year. I say, God, how bad now? Even me, that one too hard. Let's discuss. And when God prevailed on me, I called the lady. I said, I want to bless you for blessing me. She said, okay. I said, God, say, give this amount every month for one year. She started laughing. And she said, God had been telling her for the last two weeks. One of the ways to know God is checking your heart you are going through an examination a test and that test is meant to align your motives and your intentions with his purpose that's what it means when he says thy will be done in it as you want them that's how i want it to it brings successive instructions you see and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink no, have an anxious mind. Now, once and again, all of us default in this one. If we go by what the scripture says, do not seek what you should eat and what you should drink. Are you kidding me? Some of us that are bachelors, say amen. I know you don't want to say amen. Okay, say amen and you'll get married very soon. They, they don't even want to get married. You see that? When we live here now and go home, he didn't cook anything at home. So when they go, you see, you see the person in the shop. Say, so, what do they do here now? Say, oh, but they find waiting I go eat. Oh. And the Bible says what? Do not see. <laughs> say, make a find waiting I go eat. Oh. And he's already only one 200 naira bread. Samunaka. Is it Samun? What do I? Kalandala kavaya sakayada. Hey. He's holding that. You know that bread has muscles. Sam So boy, are they fine waiting at the Ito? He's just holding it like Next verse, please. He said, For all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that you need these things. Go on. We are reading down to verse 34. He said, But seek the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be what? Added to you. 
Do not fear little flock For it is your father's good pleasure To give you the kingdom Sell what you have and give arms Provide yourselves money bags Which do not grow old A treasure in the heavens That does not fail Where no thief approaches nor moth destroys For where your treasure is There your heart Now let me just answer somebody's heart While I was reading the previous verse Somebody says, Apostle, sell all that you have. Apostle, are you? Mo Duamas Bible talk. That's not really what he meant. Okay? Sometimes Jesus taught using figurative language. Alright? Figure of speech. When you sell all that you have, you have gotten rid of everything that you have built your reputation around. Because it is natural for a man to build his reputation based on what he has. Yes or no? Peter approached the man that was crippled at the gate. What did he say? He said, silver and gold have I known, but such as I have. Your reputation is based on what you have. That's the natural life of a human being. But when you sell everything you have, it means you have rid yourself of your reputation. You have died to yourself. So what Jesus was saying there was not really sell everything you have. What he was saying is, lose the reputation you built for yourself by your physical acqu acquisitions are you do you understand what i'm saying the reputation that you have built based on the things you have accumulated he said lose it die to it so that you can receive the one that comes from god he said and lay up for yourself treasure where no thief can break into sea in other words our actions in this life are an exchange everything we do is supposed to create for us a reward system in heaven that will materialize on earth especially when we do or we live for him do you understand that he said for where your treasure is dear your heart that's why i said sell your sell what you have because if you have it your heart is with it and when they steal it your heart will fail and when your heart fails, what will happen that's why i like job job was blessed but his heart was not in all that he had the bible says when they brought news to him that everything he had was destroyed the bible says he stood up he shaved his hair and he fell down and worshipped God. And what did he say? He said, naked I came into this world and naked. That means Job was a man who lived apart from his belongings. He was wealthy but he lived apart from his wealth. These days a young man just wants to have a breakthrough so he can show off. Buy a formatic AMG and drive around town. Particularly when you have friends from the other side who drive their parents' cars. You understand what I mean? everybody wants to make and i'm not against expanding your finances i'm not against trusting god for enlargement no it is good but as you do that live and create a, create a character and a lifestyle that makes you separated from what you have so you are not living for those things they are actually existing for you to serve you and even if they leave you will still remain alive one of my mentors said when god bless you try to live 10 steps below your true worth not because you don't want to enjoy what you have what do you call enjoyment if what you call enjoyment is what if what you call enjoyment is what you mean by just squandering these things then you need to go and read ecclesiastes solomon had everything and he made a summation there he said vanity upon vanity all is what let me tell you one thing about material things that will save you heartache the moment you desire a material thing there is this pressure on you there is this desire in you to want it to get over of it the moment you get that thing it begins to lose its value before you how many of you have experienced that so she got iphone 7 I don't even know which number. I don't know which one. Which one? Which one are they? I don't know. Eh? What? 13. Okay, so she got iPhone 7. And now it's, it's old-fashioned for her. It's still new, but it's old-fashioned. 
Now she desires iPhone 10. Then she sells that one, gathers money, buy iPhone 10. The moment she bought the iPhone 10, she wanted. That's I noticed it about material things and money. The moment you get it, it loses its value. And that's what many people live their life for. And the Bible says where your treasure is. So tonight, the question is, what is your treasure? Are they material things? Are you pursuing God and working with God simply because you want to get these things of life? You think that life is good with these things? Or are you pursuing God because you want His purpose to be fulfilled? Because you want to conform to His nature? He said, for where your treasure is, there lies your heart. And if your treasure are on eternal things, even when you have these physical things, it will not consume the joy that you have to lay hold of those eternal things. God is interested in your heart because that's where your motives are. God bless me and I will advance your kingdom. But your heart is saying something else. God is saying the 10,000 I gave to you, how much of it did you give back for my work? Say, and God, when you start giving us one million, we will we'll start giving. Meanwhile, the Bible says, he that is faithful in little, is faithful in much. That's how it starts. You want to touch heaven. You want to pray and heaven is under arrest because of you. You want to lift up your voice in a territory or in an organization and God responds. Then your heart must be completely aligned. Two things. Number one, faith must be the state of that heart. Number two, your motive will be tried by God till it conforms to his motive. When the Bible says, delight in the Lord your God and he will give you the desires of your heart, what it means there is not that if you follow God, God will give you what you want. No. What it means is that follow after God what God wants till you lose your desires for what you want. So that what God wants becomes what you want. That's what it means. I hope I've been able to speak to somebody tonight. Rise up on your feet. Let's pray. We are done tonight. My heart, my mind, my soul belongs to you. My love, my heart, it all belongs to you. You, yeah. oh, say. Listen to me tonight before we pray. The first and the most important thing to do before you go to God in prayers is to get your heart aright. That means in the place of prayer, you must give God an opportunity to search your heart. Because that prayer is supposed to bring you to a place of bonding, intimacy and partnership with God. Every time you pray, you are about to transact businesses with God in heavenly places. And if you know business at all, before you can do business with a man, you must vouch for his integrity. So if you want to pray a prayer that moves the hand of God, your heart... That means every time a man prayed in the scriptures and God moved, his heart was completely aligned. God moved so mightily through the life of Moses. Why? 
because of his heart the state of his heart all that moses wanted was god even though god made him the leader of israel moses never ever wanted to replace god god told him he said i'll make you a god and aaron your prophet but moses never took the place of god and the bible says he said he called moses his servant Deuteronomy 34, the Bible says, after Moses died, it said, never again was there a prophet whom God raised and knew face to face like Moses. Moses could go to God and God is angry. God said, I want to destroy Israel, my covenant people. God was so angry, he forgot his covenant with Abraham and he wanted to destroy them. And Moses said, repent of your anger. And God repented. He said, hold on. When you tell a man to repent of his sin, you, you should have repented first. Jesus told them when they wanted to stone the adulterous woman. He said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. So you don't go to God and say, God, repent. You don't try it when your heart is not right. But Moses told God, you must repent of your anger. And the Bible says God repented him. There were times in scripture when some men like us, in frail human nature like us, could get God to change his mind. Why? Because their heart was complete. If God finds a man whose heart is completely devoted to him, he has found enough machinery to move in a nation. The Bible says by a prophet, he brought an entire nation. He didn't need two people, five people, 100. No, one man is enough. When your heart is completely aligned, I tell you, you can stand up and shut the mouth of grave over your family. You can stand up and pull a resistance over the gates of hell. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell. You know why? Because Jesus lived for the Father. He was aligned. He had a heart that was devoted. What I'm sharing tonight or what I've shared tonight may look common. But I show you one of the greatest secrets to answer prayers. One of the greatest secrets. And that's the reason why tonight we want to pray one prayer. Lord, have mercy. Mercy is not only for sinners, no. Mercy can mean even if my heart is deceiving me now. Please, find a way to secure me into your purpose. Find a way to recondition my heart. Even if I am not qualified, qualify me by your standards can you lift your voice in the next two minutes that is the prayer that you should raise to the heavens right now lord show us mercy i didn't say be quiet i said open your mouth and pray you can pray in the spirit if you want to have mercy have mercy as you pray present your heart to him Have mercy. Mercy is the bias system of God. Mercy is God qualifying a man that is not qualified. Sometimes your motives may not align with the purpose of God. And that may bring a delay in that season. But when God shows you mercy, He can transport you to your next season. Even when your heart does not align with His motives, with His purposes. Lord, show us mercy. have mercy upon us upon our families Hey, 
God is telling me that we should pray this prayer. Some of us, we are going to pray and intercede for our families. Listen. Jesus gave, there was, there was a woman who came to Jesus. The Canaanite woman. Canaanite means she was not in the nation of Israel. She came to Jesus pleading that he will heal her daughter. Because the daughter was possessed of a devil. And Jesus told her, he said, I cannot give the bread of the children to dogs. In other words, I was sent but not for you. You are not qualified to receive that which I came with. And the woman said back to Jesus, she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that falls. What she was saying was mercy, have mercy. That's what she was saying. That no matter how those children eat the bread, crumbs will still fall and the dogs will still eat it. In other words, even if we are not qualified, qualify us by mercy. And Jesus said, great was your faith. And by her prayer, her daughter was healed. Some of you need to pray for your families. Perhaps you are here, you are the only godly one in your family. Maybe all of them are having Christian names, but their lifestyle is nothing to write home about. And because of that, the devil has a hold on that family. The devil is perpetrating all kinds of evil. But you can stand tonight, even if God will not look upon your family because of the activities going on there, but you can stand and cry for mercy. And in his mercy, he will remember you and visit your family. Can you lift your voice and intercede on behalf of your family and ask for his mercy according to your mercy? Remember us according to your mercy. Let there be revival again according to your mercy. Let there be restoration again. If you understand the prayer, you will pray. Lord, we may seem to be not qualified. Show us mercy. Show us mercy. Show us mercy. so let the lifting of my hands touch your heart let the lifting of my voice touch your heart my worship touch your heart my devotion reach your heart can we sing that song as a family of faith lifting up my head 
hands touch you are saying lord i want my heart to be aligned with your purpose let the government of heaven be a throne in my heart let your will be done in my heart my devotion touch your Touch your heart, touch your heart, my devotion, my devotion. Say, come on, one more time, let me lift it up my hands, come on. Lifting up my hands, touch your heart. Lift your hands and sing it to him. Lift it up my voice. Lift it up my voice. Let's sing it together. Let the lifting of my hands. You are saying, Lord, let your will be done in my heart, in my life. Let your government be enthroned in my heart. Your government alone be enthroned in my heart. If I live, I live for you alone. You say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Touch your hand. One more time. Let the lifting of my hand. Let the lifting of my hand. Touch your heart. Let the lifting of my voice. So that you can move in this place by devotion. With our eyes closed and everybody standing everywhere. If you are here and you know that you need to give your heart to the Lord Jesus. You may have been coming to church, you may have heard about him, but you truly don't know him from your heart. Jesus is truly not the Lord of your heart. And you want to surrender him to him tonight. I'd like you to lift your right hand wherever you are. Unashamedly, boldly to him as a sign of surrender. Or perhaps you are here, you used to be born again. God once had your heart. You were active in church. You lived for him. You were serving him in all that you did. But certain things in life has played you off from that track. And you don't really think that God is your Lord again. And you want to make a recommitment. You want to rededicate your heart again. I want you to lift your right hand. Unashamedly to the heavens. What God needs is your heart. If he has your heart, he has your life. God bless you. I see some hands lifted. God bless you. If he has your heart, he has your life. If he's not Lord in your heart, he's not Lord at all over your life. If your hands are lifted high up, I want you to come to the front very quickly and I will pray with you. And as they come, please just clap for them. Please run to Jesus and surrender to him. Say yes while you can. Say yes to him before this congregation of the saints. Let him be the Lord over your heart. Surrender to him. Keep clapping. I feel there are people who need to join them. Let it be Lord over your heart. While you hear my voice now, come to him.
Hallelujah. The Bible says in John chapter 2 verse 23, I believe. The Bible says Jesus did not commit himself to people. For he knew the heart of man. He knew that man could not be trusted. I beg your pardon. He knew that man could not be trusted. So all the while he was alive, he never gave himself completely to people. And that's why on the cross, when he gave his life for us, he gave his life because he had offered it to the Father. God is looking for men that will give their hearts and their life to him. Those of you in the front, I want to salute your courage. I want you to put your right hand on your chest as a point of contact to your heart and say this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I repent of my sins. And I believe that you died and rose again that I will be saved. I surrender my heart to you. I declare that you are Lord over my heart and over my life. And I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray for these ones in the name of Jesus. I declare that their sins are forgiven. I declare that they have new life in you. And I declare from today that you will be the Lord over their heart. Let your government be enthroned in their life. Let them live for you and let them serve you all the days of their lives. Fill them with your spirit and may their lives move from glory to glory. In Jesus' name.